So, <clears throat> you know, uh, I'm going to start. So, so what I'm going to do, so first of all, please make this interactive. Michael, give me like a 10 minute warning or something um, so that I don't go too far over. That would be awesome if you don't mind. And uh, please feel free to ask questions as we do this. So in the course of this uh, talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk about what are the opportunities? Why is machine learning indeed important in healthcare? It seems obvious. You've heard about all these massive successes, but the truth is machine learning has really not had any sort of significant sustained impact in healthcare. There are a number of barriers why, which I'll talk about them. And then I'm going to focus specifically on the barrier that relates to distributed learning. Um, and then specifically talk about from that angle, there are many, many challenges for ML and AI and healthcare, but talk about what are the metrics that we need to consider when we talk about doing distributed learning, whether it's federated learning, you know, some kind of differential privacy, whatever, right? Um, if time permits, I'll then go into uh, further privacy considerations, or I can delve more deeply into some of the AI challenges in healthcare, we'll keep it interactive. Talk about some of the problems I have tackled just by way of personal background. I stepped on from my KPD position almost a year ago. I'm now leading a startup that's focused on using machine learning AI and electronic health data to tackle chronic disease and uh, to address disparities in healthcare. I don't know if this is a uh, big focus in Europe and the rest of the world, but in the US, this is a rampant focus because there's lots of data showing that. Healthcare outcomes are very different depending on the color of your skin or what, uh, how poor you are or where you live compared to the average population. And ML AI can actually either, as we know from the field of responsible AI, which I know there'll be many talks on, either address it or actually widen the disparity. So how do we make sure we don't do that? And that sort of falls back into some of the challenges with the learning in healthcare. And obviously, please ask questions anytime. All right, as, as Lenara indicated in her picture when she started, you know, there are so many opportunities, so many industries which have been completely transformed by AI or machine learning. I mean, the finance industry from the 90s, you know, Quartz just relied on ML AI, transportation, we had the need, you know, Mr. Musk, where would we be without, without uh, AI and self driving cars, the new revolution, manufacturing retail, Amazon, all those companies, mobile, all have become completely transformed. We keep hearing about these amazing successes in healthcare. And I'm focusing on clinical successes. There have been some very good financial successes with, in terms of how to get better reimbursement, et cetera. But really, the real promise is how do we use this to do what healthcare is supposed to do? improve patient outcomes and reduce the costs of healthcare, which if you open a newspaper, you know, are just going through the roof, right? In the US, they're about 18% of GDP. Globally, they're about seven, eight percent of GDP for all the countries they're rising. Um, so what are some of the successes? And later on, if time permits, I will point out some of the characteristics of this field that make them ideally suited to machine learning. So, you know, Michael talked about some of the businesses I did. There was one of the businesses which was a multi-billion dollar business for Siemens, it was machine learning on medical images, right? So every year, thousands of hospitals, uh, millions of medical images are generated, ML algorithms run on them, find cancers, heart abnormalities, neural abnormalities, help physicians make detection, detect diseases early, et cetera, save lives, et cetera. Fantastic success story, right? And and in 2005 to 2010, sort of when we did this, you know, someone had sort of said to me that we were sitting in 2020, that would still be the signature uh, success in healthcare. I would have said, no way. I mean, machine learning would, would have taken over, but it hasn't. Um, you know, hospital readmission prediction. And I'm sorry, I'm bringing in this a US view. This is one of the major drivers of cost. People get in, get admitted to hospital, get relieved, and come back within 30 days. Major driver of cost. So can we find the patients who are likely to get readmitted that we can treat them, et cetera? Wonderful job, lots of solutions out there. Uh, a lot of research has been going on for the last decade with the explosion of you know, genome and all the others, proteomes, all these things in terms of basically genotype, phenotype matching. Can we 
spine diseases can we find causes? And one of the things that fills me with great excitement, if you haven't read about it, I don't know if there were papers in this conference about it, go look at AlphaFold, the, the newest thing that came out from Google. I hope our speaker will speak about it because that has the potential to fundamentally revolutionize drug discovery. Essentially, you can take exercises that took six months, you know, you have a protein and figuring out how it folds and what its structure is a very complicated problem. Now you can do it in seconds or minutes. And the accuracy is within 0.01%, which is equal to the best, you know, when you compare it to the crystal glass. This will have the potential to revolutionize the way we do drug discovery because drugs are really about jigsaw puzzles, matching shapes of drugs to shapes of proteins. Great. Sorry. I, I just had a question on uh, uh, regarding that uh, about it. So the alpha fold it does require a whole bunch of infrastructure, though, doesn't it? Oh yes, so absolutely. And and they I, have not... and uh, yeah, like I mean, Google can afford it because they have that infrastructure. Because if you look at the number of teraflops they used for the computation of these folds, uh, it ran for a few weeks. And uh, so, but it, what what do you think about that? Like. Uh, in terms of resources, uh, uh, would it be possible to for common so first you know, usage? All, uh, there's a speaker from Google who's going to speak next. <laughs> so I want to be very, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> very, very careful about what I say. But I'm going to give you a, a general uh, view based on other things I've seen in happen. First of all, this is version one, right? Competition will come. So there's an issue about the heat signature and an impact on the environment. Let's set that aside. Right? Let's just set that aside for a second and say, you know, the, the same arguments have come up about, you know, blockchain and stuff like that. Are we really, you know, driving our energy? So let's set that aside. The competition costs will come down. It will become easier uh, and cheaper, like everything else, and machines will become easier. Will become easier to use. I personally have gotten. I think about five calls over the last four weeks from startups or would we start a private equity firm saying, how do we do discovery? I mean, the whole, from looking at it from that angle, the whole financing of private equity and venture capital into drug discovery in healthcare is just going through the roof. And a lot of it is being driven by this work. You bring up a very good point about how easy is this scale? I am not an expert in that field specifically. I just mentioned because my area is more healthcare rather than life sciences. But speaking to people whom I know and respect, there's a tremendous excitement. Now, I don't know if they've actually gone through and said how scalable it is. You ask an excellent question. I will look that up and, and, and or perhaps the speaker from Google can answer that. Um, do, they, do they want to try? Michael, who, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of the other team. Blaze, uh, Blaze, yeah. Place. Do you want to yeah. try an answer? Oh, I don't think he's here, is he? Okay, all right. No. Yeah. So great, great opportunities, but no widespread success, no widespread use. So why is that? Right. So, but before I go into why this hasn't succeeded, let me talk to you about what seems like the easiest of low-hanging fruits. The machine learning AI people look at this problem and go like, why is this a problem? Why isn't this solved? It seems so trivial. So when I look at healthcare, and those are great examples, when I look at what the major drivers of costs and outcomes are, it's actually surprising. It's actually chronic diseases. And chronic diseases are a massive opportunity for machine learning. And what are chronic diseases? Chronic diseases are things like hypertension, and high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes. And the problem with these is that, so the best analogy I would give is, imagine you're in a canoe in a gentle stream, right? And, and you're floating along and everything's fine. And that's you at early stage of this chronic disease. Well, at time, this becomes a, a, a river, which is fast flowing. You then get some rapids and eventually you get to a waterfall and the waterfall we can go, but it's your normal to death or heart attack or whatever it is. So if when you're close to the waterfall, I intervene and I give you a powerful outboard motor, boat, I give you a horse, it doesn't matter. This current's going to wash you. If I intervene way earlier when you were in the uh, 
uh, when you were in the little stream and handed you a little oar, or even your hand paddle, you could prevent yourself from ever floating downstream, right? That's chronic diseases, right? If you can catch them early, you can treat them at in pennies or fractions of pennies uh, a year, a day, in, uh, in, and keep the cost down. But that doesn't happen. They're a major problem in the US and globally. And the stats I'm going to give are the US stats. Generally, they get global stats, you kind of double them in terms of dollars, and obviously people impact the students. So the US healthcare budget is about four trillion. One trillion are direct costs related to chronic kidney disease. Almost four trillion are the impact that we consider days lost, productivity loss, which is actually 20% of the US GDP. It's a massive impact. It's also the leading cause of death and diabetes, disability in the US and worldwide. Six in 10 adults in the US suffer from chronic disease. Four in 10 have two or more chronic diseases. And that leads to terrible problems. But as I said, if you can diagnose them and treat them early, life is great. And often the diagnostic test is very, very cheap. So why is this a problem? It seems to be perfect for machine learning AI. Let's go find people early. So let's look at chronic kidney disease, which to me is a signature example. So these stats are sort of staggering. And again, I'm gonna give US stats because those are the ones I know most accurately, but these are true everywhere in the world. 15% of the US adult population, one five, 37 million adults suffer from chronic kidney disease. This is a staggering stat. Only 10% of them know they have it and are diagnosed. So, right. And the cost of chronic kidney disease is $130 billion with a B dollars a year. It's one of the major drivers of healthcare costs in the world. So, seems very simple, right? Uh, and it's a silent epidemic because you, unlike, you know, you have no symptoms unless you're tested for it. So what's our approach? We can build machine learning and AI models that will either be able to do early identification of disease or of the patients who, are, who have disease, you know, the analogy, find them in the river, find them in the stream, or find those who are very likely to, to, to degenerate quickly to have disease progression, and we can treat them aggressively, which is great. And if you do this, you will stop or slow disease progression. You know, new drugs will actually stop you from getting worse. Here's a very simple example. If you took a patient with, so the end stage of kidney disease is called ESRD, end stage renal disease, which is, has got three options. You can have dialysis, you can have transplant, it's called death dialysis or transplant. Those are your three options and it's incredibly expensive. If you got this disease early and simply treated the blood pressure with an over-the-counter pill, it can delay the onset of chronic of end stage renal disease by seven to ten years. So massive impact with low income, right? And it saves over a hundred thousand dollars a year per patient that you do. Okay. So just delving into this a little bit more, as I explained, the costs, there are five stages of kidney disease, one, one through five. Five is end stage renal disease. Um, and <clears throat> the cost increase exponentially in stage three, then we have divided into two stages. And this is where there's a maximum number, about six and a half percent of the US population of stage three. <clears throat> That's about 16, 15 to 20 million adults. 80% don't know they have the disease. And when you're in stage three, you have irreversibly lost 50 to 75% of your kidney. Our bodies are such marvelous engineering marvel, marvels, right? You can donate one kidney if you're healthy, right? You lose 50% of your function, you don't feel it. It's only when you get to about 70, 75% loss that you start to get symptoms. And by then, you're already sort of, you know, in the rapids part of the, of the strain. It's very hard to keep you from going away from this exponential cost. So, and you can confirm it with an expense with a test that costs less than 50 so great, let's do this to early diagnosis. And then once you do it, if you can find them early, if you can identify which patients you should do this test for, and the obvious question is, well, why don't you test everyone? There are good reasons not to, medical reasons that have to do with 
having too many false positives that actually cause worse problems. You can't test it. But if you test it with this risk, they clearly defined guidelines that will still stop progression. The new drugs that have just come out in the last six months that are specific to chronic kidney disease that can completely reverse it. Uh, not reverse it, stop it. Nothing, you can't get back to kidney function you've lost. And as I said, you can get, so perfect example. So, so the question arises, the natural question arises, why is this a problem? So just think about it, right? We diagnose 20% of the patients with chronic kidney disease, right? So if we had some, an AI algorithm that doubled its efficiency, so if it had 40% specificity and 40% sensitivity, you know, which are numbers we would laugh at if someone said build an AI system that had 0 0.4, 0 0.4 specificity, you would more than double the effectiveness of current care. So why is this a problem? Yeah, in healthcare, we know ah, this is a massive problem. Why are we not solving it? All right. This brings us to what is the primary barrier for mammal adoption in healthcare. So <clears throat> um, you guessed it, right? It's lack of access to large and diverse patient data. There are many other problems with healthcare, but they don't relate to the distributed learning aspect. We can come to that data. So because of HIPAA in the US or GDPR in Europe and other regulations all over the world, healthcare institutions are very nervous about sharing their data. Um, they also worry that people are gonna you know, use their data and make billions of dollars and they would get nothing out of it. So they don't want to, they're not gonna create the data and put it in a common pool for us machine learning guys to come get it. Because of regulatory concerns, reputational concerns, the last thing you know, a Mayo Clinic wants is a headline that says Mayo Records breached, right? And it's fine printed to say Karenastics or so the read that patient. Karenastics doesn't come whatever it is. So, well, you know, we can do this. We will pool large databases and many international efforts underway to create large databases. But because of these things, you have to do what is called de-identification. And this is one of the characteristics of the four problems I mentioned earlier that make healthcare. Okay. A bunch of images, yeah, they find is easy. You just strip the dichrome head and you strip the name, you're done. Same with genomics, same with proteins, right? You don't, have, you don't need to know the name of the patient to do that. We are identifying a health record, which has got lots of varied information, tests, lab, free, no expenditure, whatever, is an expensive process. So it is very expensive to scale, and more important, it's very expensive to keep databases current. Secondly, the data is biased. It's only large research institutions that have the resources to commit to doing this. 80% of care is given in smaller institutions. They don't even have an EHR. And often when you build these databases, you are restricted to the lowest common denominator. You only use the variables that everybody has because that's sort of the machine learning hammer we use when we come at it, which is to say, well, we use the most common So again, this seems to be leading up, right? So, so this seems perfect for distributed learning. We have these methods, federated learning, whatever, that will go, the data will stay in place, it's perfectly safe. Um, so to scale, you can't do it with the yeah, I'm convinced, right? Imagine Google's success if we had said, Google had said, well, we can build you this wonderful search algorithm, but before we start, can you please put your web page in this particular fixed format so that, you know, we, well, nothing would have happened, right? It's or the same with financial data, right? Financial data by its nature tend to be structured. So the only way for healthcare AI to explode at scale is to leverage data that's collected routinely without a single manual step for cleaning, for de-identification, privacy, and more, right? So this seems perfect for distributed learning. We'll send our algorithms into the institutions, they'll do their stuff, they'll share their models, we'll build our deep nets, they'll go back and forth. Voila, we have perfect models. Why is this not, why aren't we jumping up? And there are lots of papers in the literature coming out, including some major papers that are touting distributed learning as the answer for healthcare. And I believe it is, and Michael and I are working together on this, but I think there are problems. And if the problems aren't acknowledged, we'll actually have the reverse. There'll be 
there'll be some bad incidents and then we'll get, we'll get stepped back. So, assuming we can solve the problems of healthcare using semantic interoperability, secure access, clinical practices, most of the useful data is in unstructured form, infinite dimensions, external SQS data, ontology, all sorts of wonderful stuff where, you know, the word blood pressure is referred to in three different ways in the same institution and 20 different ways across five institutions, getting that information. Um, assume we set those aside. Let's just say now we've got this magic metric and we want to apply distributed learning. What are the key considerations that we should keep into account to say, yes, it is okay, it is safe to do distributed learning and our models will be effective. They will actually solve the problem we want them to solve meaning they will, you know, in the case of chronic kidney disease, do early diagnosis, save outcomes, stabilize, reduce toxicity. So the first obvious one is, you know, overall model performance. Of course, we want our accuracy, specificity, sensitivity to be high. Uh, but the second one, as I've alluded, is privacy. How do we make sure that privacy means HIPAA, GDPR, or all the other alphabet super regulations are met? The third issue, and this is an important one, is what is the performance in small subpopulations? So it turns out in healthcare, <clears throat> there are certain populations on which it's much more important to do well than on the overall population. I'd given a hint of this earlier when I talked about disparities of care, and we'll go to this. And the last bit is the intelligibility of learned knowledge. So we will we will we will go into each of these. Any questions so far? I had uh, one question. Um, so you did mention some of the uh, uh, issues that we have with the, you know, uh, building systems for healthcare, for example. Um, so one of the so I had an experience with building a decision support system for uh, nurse healthcare for actually the nurse regulatory board in the, among three different countries. Um, yeah, so so one of course was the data issue, right? So they wouldn't give us enough data. We literally had like uh, 1,500 to 2,000 samples from each regulatory board, which was like barely anything to build uh, text models, especially. Um, but the other issue that we saw is when we finally did build a prototype system and wanted to uh, eventually deploy it, they did not have the resources to actually take us take what we built and deploy it within their own uh you know their own infrastructure like uh, they firstly have very minimal infrastructure to begin with right and uh, so when we do build these systems um in your experience how uh, what's the deployment like so how do you deploy these things i mean of course if they can afford to hire uh, data scientists or uh, consultants and things like that, of course. But most of these, they don't have the budget for that. So mostly they have to try to maintain it, uh, you know, in-house, but they don't have that. So uh, what's that in your, in your experience? So how has that been tackled at all? Okay, I didn't bring this up, but you actually bring up the <laughs> biggest two point. The single biggest barrier. So I can't tell you, and 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 we can't go into this right now, just because this would be a whole day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A whole day. You hear of all these amazing research studies. People do they get data, university, and I don't mean to knock it. I think this is fantastic, right? You say, hey, we do it from so many cancers. You know, we improved that. They go to deploy it and boom, it, it completely unused. And the reason is, and, and this is one of the reasons we, you know, our, I talked about a medical imaging problem that was probably deployed at thousands of hospitals, millions of patients. It, the AI results were presented as part of their normal workflow, right? So the word, word workflow, there's a way clinician, whether it's nurses or doctors, like Similarly, we built a solution for improving the quality of care of patients like this. It was part of their workflow of measuring quality. It came in and it 
provided improvements. So if you don't actually, so I, I this is actually the number, so it's really the barrier to ML impact, not just adoption, right? Is that it has to be within what the patient, within what the doctor has. Even something as simple as I have to turn and look at another window means you're dead. It's not going to happen, right? Just it sounds, uh, but that is, I, I that's the number one bet is that you can have the world's best AI, but if it yes. isn't, right? So yes. it really requires careful design over time. You, you don't need consultants, but you need to understand their workflow, and then you need to understand where in the workflow it fits in. And then you might need consultants to actually figure out to insert it in the workflow there. Um, and you might say, this is a terrible workflow. Why are you doing it this way? I can help you do it this way. I'm not gonna help. You just have to accept that going forward um, and go from there. I come from a family of physicians, right? Um, I will tell you this, physicians don't think they are God. They know they are God. So it's, just, it's a true statement. I'm not, I'm not I'm, so just trying to, you know, right? My brother, who I love dearly and I collaborate with, when I ask him a medical question, he turns into Professor Lau. Right? I mean, just voice changes, the way we, you know, it's just, you know. So you have to work in the world. So, so you bring up a very critical point, but, you know, <coughs> again, I've tried to focus this discussion on what is important for distributed learning, not what's important for health. These problems, are like these other problems exist independent of whether you do distributed learning or not. Fair. So I'm going to try and speed up a little bit so we can get into the, um, all right. So let's look at overall model performance, which is kind of obvious, right? We want high AUC, sets of sensitivity, specificity. We want to get large representative data sets because, you know, and there's tons of research, including this conference, including this day, is that if you use distributed learning, whether it's federated learning, access data in place in multiple institutions, you do improve performance, right? And, and, and the issue here now is not reducing traffic, but reducing, you know, the, uh, the, the computation, uh, the energy usage of devices, but really to improve the performance. What could you do? You could identify novel markers of risk for chronic kidney disease or other diseases. You predict disease to help clinicians intervene earlier, which is what you want to call progression. And even, you know, the dream of first-class medicine. This is how you treat Barat. This is how you treat Jim. This is how you treat Mary. Very different, different genders, different racial backgrounds, different history, different, right? How do we personalize it? All can be done. So, great. So the overall model performance very well suits itself to a distribution. Unfortunately, that's not the only metric. So let's look at the standard federated learning approach where we use neural networks to exchange model parameters between sites, whether it's site to site or whether it's just site to site. So model parameters have been shown to memorize parts of the training data set, revealing private information. Um, you know, so that is obviously a problem. We know we know that those can be those can be addressed. So I just put in some notes here. Um, and they're also Issues, even if you don't do that, right? If you have an adversary, you know, either central server or one of the nodes is an adversary, there's data shown that you can do model inversion from uh, model updates, you can analyze gradients, you can do adversarial attacks, and there are these so called white box passive attacks and active attacks, et cetera, that are an issue. So, something to keep in mind sharing model parameters, if done without thought, can violate HIPAA and other considerations, um, especially if you learn nets and you overtrain them on small data sets, essentially memorize the training So let's look at the other thing that is getting a lot of, 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 uh, of press is differential privacy. So differential privacy is ways to preserve records in sensitive databases um, while publishing data statistical information. Um, so, um, so at least two ways to use. So one is 
standard way, right? We'll, we'll, every hospital will use differential privacy to get some guarantees, which they are comfortable with. They'll have a dial as to level and we'll share that with centers. Awesome. The second is federated learning itself can be combined with differential privacy you know, for, for, for mute uh, uh, model parameters uh, and where parameters can be seen. And I'm probably not going to have detail to go into this. I can provide a bunch of citations, Michael, if there's interest uh, in to this afterwards. Uh, you know, there's these things called white box and black box attacks. So differentially private federated learning has been shown to mitigate white, white box attacks, a particular kind of risk called membership inference risk. So the fundamental risk is I want to say, is this patient in the database or not in this database that I'm looking at? Uh, but during active white box attacks, we can actually not just observe, but question the server, such differential privacy-based solutions are in that have been shown to be there. So again, ways to, I'm not saying that these are unsolvable, but these are things you have to keep in mind and create some guarantees when you actually do this. So let's get to the third metric. Why do we care about machine learning for small subpopulations? Why is this important? Well, turns out, and again, I'm giving US statistics, but this would be true anywhere in the world. Healthcare has got huge disparities for vulnerable subpopulations. This is true not just in acute disease, but in chronic disease. For example, for chronic kidney disease, it has been known since 1982 when the first landmark paper was published. That showed that black Americans had four times the rate of transplant than their white counterparts, despite having the same incidence and prevalence of disease. So they both got it, but one progressed further. Now, there are many factors, and often people say it's genetic, but honestly, it's not genetic. It's, got, it's environmental, it's access to care. But one of the, you know, there are a whole bunch of socioeconomic racial causes, and there's data emerging that it's more the social economics or so-called social determinants of health, which you may have heard of, which may be a very large contributing factor. But from a practical perspective, lack of early diagnosis, lack of access is a huge factor, right? So therefore, there's also research that shows that um, in the field of responsible AI, that you know, if you take data that's biased, which healthcare is, and lots of great work, John Kleinberg showed that <clears throat> a major algorithm that is used to diagnose, to make treatment recommendations for 70 million Americans is biased against black Americans. So just based on race, if you took two identical records and you flipped it, you'll be much less likely to be recommended for uh, treatment just based on changing that one variable, which is the race of the person. Um, so, and why? Because the data contains those biases. So we need to make sure that the models we build address these disparities because those are the people who need most help. And if we actually don't help them, it's actually going to make it worse because healthcare costs are driven by the sickest people, not by the average person. Right? So, so therefore, that brings us to a third metric, which is the performance of small subpopulations. So we can all learn some very valuable lessons from you know, good ideas that perhaps don't work when we take them to real life. So, Differential privacy got a massive boost when in 2018, the United States Census Bureau, every 10 years, the US does a census and produces data. And previously it was only releasing, you know, summary stats because you've got to preserve the privacy. They said, we are going to use differential privacy and we will release the census data and we'll provide privacy guarantees, right? Um, and, you know, However, that's the phrase controversy. For example, differential privacy, which works by injecting noise into the data and senses information that's judged as too unique, disproportionately has been shown to disproportionately affect information, let alone learn models about small populations and minority groups. In fact, many states have now sued the US Census Bureau and they're no longer releasing it, stopping them from really releasing it, concerned about accurate reporting. So these concerns are actually magnified in healthcare. Why? 
first of all, health outcomes are deeply unbalanced, which is a good thing. I mean, even chronic kidney disease, which is prevalent, is only true for 15% of the population, for 5%. People who have cancers and it's more, which is a good thing. But from machine learning point of view, it's a terrible thing. I mean, it's quite vastly, you know, it's the sunspot problem. The best prediction of when there's a sunspot is never, right? Because that obviously is not particularly useful. Um, so by the very design of differential privacy, it results in models whose proportions are disproportionate, uh, neglect the information and maintain the distribution, which is what we're concerned about. I mean, DP just wipes it out because that's, that's, that's too easy. Secondly, differential privacy results in models whose predictions are disproportionately influenced by large demographic groups. Again, the opposite of what we want. And this, as we've shown, is particularly troublesome for chronic disease and disadvantaged populations. Um, and then, Finally, you know, using differential privacy has been shown to actually magnify or amplify these disparities. And this is sort of from the field of responsible AI, where, you know, if you just ran naive ML or AI without actually addressing it and did it from bias data, you would actually magnify the disparities as was shown by this algorithm that Kleinberg and Lily Anathan showed actually was widely used, 70 million people, was actually widening the disparities by giving less care to the subpopulations that need it most. All right. So, yes. Just sir. the 10 minute warning. All right, thanks. Good. I'm, I'm sort of nearing the end, so this is perfect. So the fourth issue to be concerned about is intelligibility. And this is one where federated learning needs to are many healthcare. So one of the of the four examples I showed right at the beginning: images, genomics, protein structure. One of the characteristics for them are rather than having you know data that's easy identifiable, data that's in a single format, even though it's very wide, you know, massive data, is that the verification is it doing a good job is often from the result. In a medical image, it's a dot put on the image. The physician look at it and go like, "Yep, that looks like a cancer." Thank you. No, that's rubbish. Here's the feedback. A neural network that just uh, gives you an answer, you know, based on it. That's not enough. Well, there and 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 this is something which, unfortunately, a lot of researchers in healthcare ignore, despite landmark studies by Greg Cooper in the 90s. Um, I'll give you an example of this post pneumonia. Right? Um, what do you think is the single best? So this is a problem that show all over the world. Someone shows up in the emergency room at one in the morning. They have pneumonia. And the attending has to make, triage person has to make a decision. Do I admit them to the emergency room? Do I send them home and tell them to come back in the morning, right? So the single biggest factor is how sick are they? Are they likely to die or get a lot worse in the next eight hours? Do they need immediate care or can I send them home, stabilize them, send them home and have them come the next day where the costs are significantly less, right? So five times less if I don't admit them. The single best predictor of outcome, this is an early study I did of the morning, some of the folks who went on to do the study, was guess what? The best metric to predict good outcome was don't treat the patient, send them home. Patients who were sent home had far better outcomes than patients who admitted. Well, there was a minor problem called a confounded outcome over there. The deaths, a doctor was using their clinical judgment to decide who needed to be prevented. They were only sending patients over, which is not very easy. So, but now let's come to, that's an easy fix. I mean, let's come to a more subtle problem. So there was this study that was done in the 90s with Greg Cooper, Rich Garuana, a bunch of others, colleagues I've worked with which looked at predicting many issues in a large health system. And one of the things they looked at <clears throat> was the risk of death from pneumonia problem, which is fundamentally what you want the model to tell you. And they evaluated a whole host of models and by far the most accurate models were neural networks, this is even before deep networks. But they, without the, the use of networks, was uniformly rejected by clinicians because of this one thing. So one of the things that 
neural network found was that patients who had asthma were actually had better outcomes, even whether they admitted or not, than patients who didn't have asthma. And again, this was a subtle outcome. And there was a rule that was learned, a rule-based, traditional rule-based system, C4.5 for people who were deficient to turn into a rule, which said this, doctors looked at it and said, that's crazy. But this was true in the data. And the reason is very simple. When someone is admitted to the hospital and they have asthma, every physician, first year medical student knows that it's a huge risk factor for pneumonia. They get extra special care. They're out of prison, right? This pattern was also true in the neural network when you actually investigated the data and you flipped that one variable. It wasn't visible, right? And so the question then came up, how many other such dangerous conclusions are there in the neural network that we don't see? So when you are actually using this to make treatment decisions, life and death, into admission to Fenno, intelligibility is very important. And this is a problem with federated learning. You know, they only work for a, uh, you know, a, a cl limited class of machine learning algorithms that support efficient periodic aggregation of parameters, for instance, averaging the parameters of set of linear models, or more typically with black box neural networks, which I'm going to talk to. So we need human interpretable models, you know, whatever we do. You know, whether it be decision trees or, or rule ensembles or generalized additive models that are gaining some, or the recent field of mimic learning that takes the deep nets and translates them for stochastic, you know, gradient booster trees, et cetera. This is something to be important because a doctor is going to ask why, at least in the beginning. So to come back to the question you asked for clinical acceptance, it's not enough to have a good decision you have to be able to explain why. You do that often enough, they stop asking why. You need to be able to explain why. So I'm, I've got five minutes to so I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna just briefly talk about the three problems we are working on my group. Kernastics is working on. I already talked about, you know, early diagnosis, disease progression for chronic disease. So all of this is, all these problems are machine learning and AI and looking at not just the general population, but vulnerable subpopulations. So we're doing this. One of the one of the benefits of actually working in healthcare for years is I have access to data from three large medical centers with over 12 million patients who are interested in doing distributed learning and with privacy parameters. So we are doing this problem. Michael is actually working with me on this, which is fantastic. Um, I'm working with the Veterans Administration, which is the largest healthcare system in the US, 9 million patients. I have right now access to about 15,000 patients. We're looking at the opioid abuse problem, which is a huge pandemic in the US, but it's even worse in veterans. They're twice as likely to have opioid abuse. And the problem we're looking at is opioid recurrence. So you get opioid abuse, you get treated, back. So we're using machine learning to say which treatment is more likely. And then again, we're looking at socioeconomic data, social terms, to try to figure out how to take into account poor, rural, race, how that affects our teams. And the final one is I'm working with the large conglomerate of universities to investigate a uh, so Alzheimer's disease is a deadly disease. If it wasn't for COVID, it would be the number one health crisis facing humanity over the next two decades. We're getting older, we are all going to be, we're all at risk for dementia. This is the most common form of dementia. There are some new emerging treatments, but again, early diagnosis is important. Right now, the diagnosis is done very late with a very expensive imaging test. Could we do a simple blood-based biomarker test based on new blood panel and genomic analysis? And we're working with several large university consortium to make this happen. I'll stop now and ask if there are any further questions. So just fantastic opportunities. Um, 
very open to collaborating and working with Michael and Lenara and stuff like this. So if you're interested, just reach out to Michael and he'll put you in touch with me. Um, and uh, I'll pause if there are any questions. Thanks, Bharat, for this really inspiring talk. It's, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, please, everyone, just feel free, open your mic if you can, or raise your hand if you can't. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the room settings. Uh, to sleep, Michael. So, <laughs> if I can ask a question while we wait for somebody else to ask a question, um, so uh, Bharat, uh, um, do you have any experience with uh, using modular networks, modular deep learning networks? I'll be honest with you. I mean, none of the solutions I have developed and deployed have used neural networks. I'm sort of like a uh, it's not a religious objection to using them, but many of the concerns I have uh, have to do with that. Now, Michael is trying to convert me. Uh, but no, I have not had any experience using those, and nor am I an expert in, in that kind of work. So, please, please tell me why you think they are. Well, modular neural networks, then you can make them somewhat interpretable. Uh, oh, there's still, oh. There is still uh, some work, uh, that, that's a, actually a lot of work. The reason I bring it up is also because I'm working on it. <laughs> right. uh, actually, my, so, my collaborator, Jan Lu, works on that. Sorry, I didn't, she calls them something else, but yes, uh, at, at USC, yes. Yeah, I mean, there it's, are a bunch of flavors of it, uh, but the, the gated modular neural networks uh, uh, are more interpretable in the sense that uh, the modules tend to be much simpler that you use uh, and uh, if you can work out the gating efficiently it uh, it is more interpretable uh, way to build the system uh, from a error attribution perspective um, from um, the fact that the modules that you're using are actually much simpler models it can even just be linear uh, networks themselves uh, so you can have uh, interpretability, you can have gate, which the gate can doesn't have to be a network. The gate can be like, say, a decision tree, for example, then you can have feature level interpretability, probably. Um, no, no, that's exactly that would be very useful. And, and that's certainly one of the things I'd be very open to sort of trying on some of the problems of working on. We sort of have a test bed of about two and a half million patients that we have in a secure enclave where we are working on methods for distributed learning. So we should go offline. I'd be very interested to see how we could maybe incorporate some of those methods. One of the things to keep in mind, and I didn't mention this as a problem, is that when you do multi-institutional learning, A, you may have different amounts of data, and B, you may have different variables at each side, different subsets of variables. So being able to learn models that are different at each side and yet somehow combine them is important. Actually, again, I think in that case, modular networks would help because you can individually learn these different modules with uh, completely different data because they also uh, facilitate transfer learning. Uh, uh, so they are- No, I'm very interested in transfer learning. Sorry, one of the things I realized is my battery is actually running out of power. So I'm going to apologize if it shuts out. I actually appropriated my son's office. <laughs> I didn't realize that I kicked him out into my crappy office, which Michael has seen. Uh, but uh, uh, I made a lot of power. So, so, yes, I think I'm very interested in transfer learning because I think that is a huge opportunity uh, for us to work on distributed learning. So, we'd love to take that conversation offline and figure out how, how we could. Very happy to yeah. incorporate that. Michael, can you make the introductions, please? That would be, I mean, the reintroductions, that would be very interesting. So do we have one more question uh, from uh, Daniel. Um, please, uh, can you unmute yourself or do I have, no, okay. Yeah, um, hi. Uh, how, how was your uh, experiments with uh, companies uh, about the topic differential privacy? Are they open to this topic? I will tell you that, <clears throat> And I'm now speaking from the viewpoint of healthcare. So payer organizations, insurance companies are very interested because that, that will help them. But if you look at healthcare institutions, the whole controversy around differential privacy, they are so risk averse that immediate reaction is no, 
no way are we going to share our data with differential privacy, especially if it means we could deduce, you know, we don't want to get sued for, you know, discriminating against black people, local people, et cetera. So it actually varies, whereas insurance companies are very keen to share the data as in, you know, can we pool our data in a way that doesn't give me competitive advantage? Actually, they'd like every other insurance company to share their data actually rather than them doing it. But, so it depends on the sector um, uh, that, that, uh, that you're looking at. Uh, but it is a topic of interest. I think like all, step, all technology steps, right? We go two steps forward, one step back, I think. This is an example, perhaps we overreached a bit too much with people who didn't understand the implications of doing differential privacy on something as large as the census data. Uh, but there's no question that we will solve those problems. There are too many smart people working on it for that not to be solved. And again, I'm looking at the next five years in healthcare. I think if you look at 25 years, there's no question that this will be a sharing data will be solved. What can we do in the next five years? Tackle the awesome. Thank you so much, Barak. It was really a great talk, great discussion. Um, You're too kind. Thank you. I no, 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 no. I, I, you know I mean it. You know I mean it.